Welcome back to Hello Nigeria. Thank you for staying with us. We have a very special guest in the studio with us today, the ex-governor of Cross River State and also an aspiring presidential candidate, and that is no other than Donald Duke. Thank you very much for being here, sir. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. How are you doing today? <laughs> Depending on your questions, I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we promise to just be nice and fair. That'll be nice. Okay. Okay, so let's go straight to the point. Now, you've tasted politics before as governor, and you did have quite an impressive track record. However, usually they say that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Why did you decide to come back again? Is it a thing of, you know, it's a bit difficult to let go of power, or are there some fundamental changes? Well, I let go changes? for 12 years, so okay, fair enough. that's some letting go. No, it's... Uh, Politics to me is a vocation and not an occupation. I was doing something before, I opted to serve, went back to doing what I was doing, and I think we are in a crisis right now, and there's an opportunity for, for good volition, and so I'm offering again to serve. Interesting. And what we're seeing now is that the policy has become very dilapidated in itself. We're seeing a lot of defections going on. And of course, all of this is leading up to the elections. Everyone is in campaign mode. And quite frankly, a lot of people are making an embarrassment of Nigeria as we speak. How do you feel about what's currently going on in Nigeria's policy? One word. Sad. Another but word. <laughs> Childish. Another word. Immaturity. Yep. No, we are better than this. Um, unfortunately, it's all a, we're now in the politics of self. So all the defections and the musical chairs are all about placing oneself in a position of opportunity. So if I think, for instance, if I want to run on for presidency and I'm in the APC and I know that there's no vacancy there, then I'll go to the PDP where I stand a better chance of... But it's not based on principle, it's not based on the nation, it's based on self, me, myself and I. Um, it happened four years ago, it's happening now, and if we don't mature, it will happen four years hence. So, uh, it's unfortunate. Now, I had a conversation once with a former governor who served at the same time you served, and he stated that he does not have a belief, he doesn't believe in our generation, the younger generation. Why? Because the older generation has set a precedence of corruption such that people go into power to amass wealth, to pillage our commonwealth, and just basically to satisfy their own personal interests. Now, we find that that has sort of set a precedence for a lot of younger people who do not want to go there for the right intentions. What's your take on younger people? Because we're going to see a lot of them in 2019 running for elections. What's your take on the well, younger you know, people in I'm politics? I'm an incurable optimist, right? And you need to have in place faith and hope um, that tomorrow will be better than today. Just because we didn't get it right and our forebearers didn't get it right doesn't mean that they wouldn't get it right. We need to keep on encouraging them. Um, idealism is more prevalent in younger people than older people. Older people who have, see, who have seen it all end up just feeling that nothing's going to change anyway and all that. But when you have youth and I, youth, you can breed some elements of idealism. So I think that... Um, we shouldn't, you know, generalize or stigmatize and say this is going to be this way. No. If a society gets better, if the country gets better, if we're, our yearnings are, uh, are being met, then certainly we would, um, would have a, a new and improved generation of Nigerians. I'm not going to write them off at all. I believe in them. I believe they're better exposed than we are. I believe they want this country to be as good as the best of nations around the world. I believe they're even more frustrated than we are because they're the prime of their lives and they see the opportunities beckoning on them, but they cannot express themselves. I'll caution, though, that youth is not the only reason to get into politics. In fact, youth without experience is a very potent, explosive bump. Okay, and I, I'll give you examples. When you're young, um, you're bursting with energy. But if you don't have any experience, right, then that energy is uncontrolled. And we saw it in 1966 when we had young officers at the age of 27, 28, without any experience. You know, they go, they wipe off the, the political leadership, they wipe off the military leadership, which inevitably led us to a, a war. If they were much older um, or more experienced, not necessarily older, but more experienced, they would have probably would have done it differently. So we've got to be careful. Um, I, I, I like youth. I'm a beneficiary of youth. I was young as a commissioner at 30. 
I was young as a governor at 37. Um, I gathered some experience because I've been in the public space since I was 19. I was a member of the Students' Union, and I was uh, uh, very, very knowledgeable in history and all that. So I was politically active, and um, I cut my teeth at the age of 30 and on, went on at 37. Right from 30 to 37, I was in public space. I was a member of the National Economic Intelligence Committee and a member of the National Economic Council. So I could say that I gathered experience. And I want as many young people as possible to be given the opportunity to gather similar, even better experience um, so that when they go into the public space, they have something to offer. But going straight from school to becoming a councillor or a member of the House of Assembly, you really have nothing to offer. It becomes an occupation rather than a vocation. And that's what we must avoid. Okay. Now, I want to use your governance as a model and apply it to your aspiring presidency. I would say that one of the largest issues that we have in Nigeria today is the fact that there is no nationwide um, database in terms of data collection for the people. 200 people can pass away and we don't know their names. We have no story to them and we can't attach any emotions to that person because, unfortunately, there's no data collection. Did you do anything with regards to data collection as governor of Cross River State? And if so, how can we now start looking towards applying that on a nationwide scale? During my time as governor, we had, that was the advent of the National ID Card Program. And rather than duplicate efforts, we supported what the federal government was doing. And it was, we had a pretty good rollout in Cross River. I still have my National ID Card. But like every other thing, it was checkered. After the government moved on, uh, uh, after there was a, the change of government, that was stopped. It was started again. I'm not sure where we are in that exercise because no one has approached me for an update or a review of what we had. So I think it's really stopped. But um, we did have it, and we did encourage every one of our citizens to get registered. Um, and we had the database retained with us. We went beyond that. We had what we call the auto photo mapping of our state, um, where it's not just drawing a map of the state, it's more like a pictorial digital map of the state. So every inch of land in the state, we can zoom in and tell you the topography and even tell you the number of people who are there at the particular time the shot was taken. And so when we were having our issues with um, uh, over Bakasi in you know with Cameroon, the map we had of the area was far more sophisticated than what the military had. They had to lend them their maps. And part of the problem with the military, if you don't have a good map, you're liable to ambush and all sorts of things. So yes, we collected data. And like you, you said the right thing. Data and data collection, or the absence of it, is a huge bane in our planning. We don't know. You're talking about identification of people and all that. We don't know how many births we have. We don't know how many deaths we have. We don't know how much infrastructure facilities that we need to bring in all that. So we're shortchanging ourselves completely. And I hope that we will re review or re 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 restart that, that uh, program. Every citizen of this nation should be identified. But realistically, how long does it take to actually achieve something like that? <laughs> 200 million people. It could take you up to two, three, four years, yeah. right, to do it. And to do it right. If I were going to do it today, I'll do it with the background of a census while collecting all the data, right, of, for a census. I'll also collect the DNA of each and every Nigerian in the storage so we know who is who. It will help our crime lab. It will help um, identify um, uh, folks if there's a national tragedy or something. I can go there, get the DNA, and immediately tell you who that person is and all that. So it's all about data. In a digital world... <laughs> You know it better than I do. It's data, data, data. So if you, we, can't, we can't operate in the world today the way our forebearers did. Um, it's everything because you're planning for, for individuals. That you, it, it just puts everything in perspective. Which is absolutely true. We need to up our game with regards to data. Data, they say, is king. Now, given the benefit of hindsight and your time as governor, if you look back are there any things you wish you did differently? Well, there's one guy I should have fired before I left office. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm serious, because um, he stayed on and he did, he did uh, I think he did a lot of hurt to a particular program, the tourism program, but I didn't fire him. So 
escape. So when people are doing is there anything you ought to have done that you didn't do yet, I should have fired. So now let's follow, let's <laughs> re relate that to our current policy. We find that there are many people currently in office that the Nigerian people have advocated that they should be fired. What would you say of certain offices that are still, you know, being certain positions that are still being occupied? How would you say um, we should have fared with regards to firing certain people? For example, the IGP of police at some point people had clamored for him to be fired. What should take that? Let me take and I'll say this very broadly. The near absence of consequences in our, in our governance is a result of, is resulting to where we are today as a nation. We're a nation of anything goes. So you mentioned 200 people. 200 people died in Plato State, right? And um, the people who are paid, whose job it is to protect in form of policing, in, in form of intelligence gathering in the SSS, in some form of the army, there's a brigade in, in Joss, and nothing happened. Nobody bore any consequence for that. The first thing you would do is to ask, what happened? How come marauders, whom you claim are not Nigerians, could come into your country and, and, and kill 200 people? What have you done thereafter? Why did it happen in the first place? There's an absence or there's... Uh, we're all reactive. We're not proactive. And, and you should investigate it. And if they were found wanting... There should, be, there should be consequences for that. I would go as far as even taking them to court for criminal negligence. People died, you know? And let's not trivialize death. Death is final. It's over. It's over for you in this life. It, it's not, you're not going to wake up in three years' time and you come back again. So we should treat it as, as serious as it demands. But nothing happens. The folks are there, and people are still saluting them. They're big men and all that, and, and as if nothing matters. So um, the word is consequence. We must ensure that we have a nation of consequences. And sometimes I tell religious folks that, you know, this thing about consequence was not, it's not a Donald Duke invention. It was, it was instilled by the Almighty. He gave you Ten Commandments, right? And the consequences for not living up to those, those you know, and that's... that's, that's for every action, there must be a reaction. So consequence is not only negative, it's positive. If you do well, you should be, you should be rewarded accordingly. Interesting. We, well, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. We also had recently that a few policemen who said who have, um, were said to have done well had been rewarded. We have a lot of drama going on in the police sector. There's so much with regards to killings, police brutality, and more recently the NSAS campaign has been going on for a while. Now, interviews from the powers that be have said that you know the NSAS campaign is just a joke and people actually are not... Because going they're to... not directly affected. You We've see, even uh, seen see, a CP They thing. seem yeah. so distant from the problem, and that's the thing. The people who are governing you uh, are not in tune with you. It's like being a shepherd and not in touch with your flock, right? Um, NSAS is real. People don't just get up and... And why would you arm someone without a uniform in the first place? Why would you arm someone, um, give him all those ammunition, and he's not identifiable? If I'm on the road and I see someone with arms, my instinct tells me that this is like a rubber, okay? And I want to get away from it. And he happens to start shooting at me, only to find, find out that he's, you know, what, SARS or something like that. So I think it's, it's executive irresponsibility. They, they're not totally out of tune with it. And, you know, while you may blame the IGP and all this, they, they, these people, we have representatives at the national and at the state level. We have governors, right? If I'm governor of a state and I have this going on in my state and I'm chief security officer, I'm going to call the police, withdraw all of them from my state. I don't want them any longer here. Period. So it's not just the IGP, right? There are various levels of governance that should have checked this. And if it's not, if the folks in the National Assembly are not inviting the Inspector General of Police to ask questions and all that, and the folks in the State House of Assembly are not inviting the Commissioner of Police to ask questions about this, then the governor can put a stop to it. Okay. okay. Now, this week marks the World Day Against Human Trafficking, and human trafficking is one of the greatest problems that I would say we have in Nigeria today. Unfortunately, however, modern slavery is ignored to a certain extent. We do have NAPTIP, we do have the Edo State Task Force, etc. 
And we're seeing a situation now where we're calling on the global community to come and help us to curtail the problem that we have with human trafficking in Nigeria. Now, this is something that I think we need to speak about. And I want to ask you how you feel towards human trafficking and how you think we need to start getting proactive and putting a stop to the issues that we are facing. 36,000 people crossed over from Nigeria to Italy alone in 2016. These are the numbers you know. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, you see, you, I smiled when you said, you know, we've invited the international community to come help us and all that. We always deal with symptoms and not the problem. Yeah. Okay? People don't just wake up and start walking across a desert, right, into Libya. It's not a one-day journey or a three-month journey. Sometimes it takes years. I've interviewed someone who took, it took him three years to get to Italy. He went through slavery. He was sold. He saw death. You, you, you sleep in the desert. Scorpions are, are, are stinging you. You wake up. The person next to you is dead. Only to get to Italy and be repatriated. Those are the symptoms of a deeper problem. The deeper problem is a failure to provide opportunity for them. If they are opportuned in their country, why do they want to walk across the desert and go through such hardship only to go sell them, sell them, them, them themselves on streets in, in Italy? So how do we revamp our failed welfare you've institutions? Got to, you've got to revamp the entire economy to cater for the huge number of people. This is not a small country. 200 million people is a large number of people. You've got to expand the economy to cater for them, to provide opportunities for them. There must be safety valves in the society. You've got to educate them. You've got to ensure that the, your healthcare system can provide for them. Um, if you, each one of us has one idea or the other, one thing I could do and all that, you must make as many people in our society as entrepreneurial as possible. If I have a great idea, I could employ 10 people. That's 10 people who would have gone to Italy and now with me and gainfully employed. And those 10 people can fend for their families. So it's a near absence of opportunity that frustrates them. And you're not going to go abroad and get an answer to that. The answer is here. If you provide for them, right, they wouldn't migrate. And we're talking of just one type of migration, the poorer type. That's a lower segment. Those are the ones that walk across and go to Italy. What about the educated ones? Yeah. What about the professionals who are daily migrating? They go abroad ostensibly for holidays and never come back. Very true. I met a guy in, in, um, in New York last year who got to New York and claimed he was, he was gay. This guy is as straight as an arrow, but he said he was gay and he was there with his best friend, right? And they're both straight guys, but they claimed they were gay and if it got back to Nigeria, they'd be, they'd be persecuted and all that. And they're having a ball. Of course, they got there. They got to put them on a welfare program, got them jobs and all that. And, and, um, but they just, they just wanted to get out of the country. And there are many, many more like that. Professionals. Dad, look, we, we are, our doctor-citizen ratio is ridiculous. We should have like one doctor for every 600 people. We have like one doctor for every 6,000. Meanwhile, people. we have 5,000 yeah. doctors in South Africa, 15,000 doctors on the NHS, you and the people are here suffering. 10% of the medical profession in the United Kingdom, not Zimbabwe, I'm sure they're made up Benin. of Nigerians. Nigerians, Nigerians exactly. 10%. That's one in every 10 medical personnel in the UK is a Nigeria. I know of people who in their old age are studying medicine because the plan is, after a few years, I want to relocate to the UK. And it boils down to a major problem. We have a structural problem. We have a poverty problem. The poverty problem spirals into different um, symptoms. Now we see another of our fears is in 2019. We have the elections coming. A lot of people have expressed fear with regards to the fact that we would have the people sell their votes because people are hungry. People need to eat. How do we guarantee that in 2019? How do we ensure that people do not sell their votes because there is a poverty problem and they need to eat? And how do we really get rid of our poverty problem? It's if we're taking India, it's beyond the for selling votes for election is beyond the poverty thing. It's total disillusionment. They believe that whether they vote or not, what would be will be. So just take the money and do whatever it is. Um, but I said earlier on that the real problem, the migrations, the social ills, the insecurity in the society has to do with the fact that our economy is no longer embracing uh, one of us, okay? The people who are, in the, who are within the economy are such a small number. So we're, we're, we run what I would call a goodwill economy, right? I have a job, so I look after you. You beg me, I give you some support, I give you tips. Look, most folks survive that way, not because they're earning anything. 
And um, you that have a job, the pressure on you is so much that you are liable to even try and steal or get corrupt so that you can get more money because of your dependents are, are, are there. Um, nothing would change in 19 except we change this narrative. Okay, it's not the elections. We hope that we will get the right person coming in. But beyond that, that right person must just get the right things done, expand the economy, deal with the issues that affect credits. Because you can't grow an economy if we don't have affordable credit. Deal with the infrastructure issues, right? And um, ensure that we galvanize the vast resources that we have because without doubt we're a very resourceful nation and that's that even makes it more pitiful and you can see wherever nigerians take to they excel whether it's good or bad they excel um but there's a lot of frustration in the land a lot of it all right let's quickly take a look at our justice um, department and the politicians now we find that lots of people have lost faith in the justice department because we feel they feel rightly that, so too yes they feel like, you know, we see the big it, fishes being exempted from cases. Now, thankfully, we have people like Justice Banjoko, who's now referred to as 1414 president, and the 1414 um, judge. And there are many people who have gone into office, stolen money, and gotten away with it. Nothing has been done to them. Which brings me to this question. You've been governor. What's your take on the immunity clause? Many people have advocated that it be totally expunged, as it's protecting a lot of people who are in power from being able to, a lot of governors and uh, certain other people who are in power from being able to... We even saw that in the Sarah report that came out, three people were even given presidential pardon also based on this clause. The immunity clause, I think, has been taken out of context and has been abused. I think it was put there to protect governors and president from being distracted by all sorts of uh, frivolous matters. Frivolous matters. But the governors themselves have abused it, and they think they're immune from corruption and all sorts of things. I think it should be amended. Certain classes of cases that you cannot exonerate, you know, if it's um, if it's a case to do with murder or even corruption, it should be investigated. It should be tried on it. Um, but so it's something that we really have to address. It shouldn't be an open blanket, as it were. You know, the same clause that talks about immunity also doesn't exonerate a, government, a governor from treason, for instance. So it's already, since there's, a, there's room already there for um, revisiting, I think it should, be, it, should, it should be taken out. Not completely, because there's some, there's some merit to it, but largely, so if it's, um, so that you don't have, I've heard of cases where governors are involved in the death of people here and now, they have killer squads and all that shouldn't have immunity for that. Um, if, it's, if it's a corruption case, before you prosecute, there should really be proper investigation because you don't want the governor distracted yeah. from his regular work. Otherwise, all he'll be doing, you know, is, is uh, in court. Or, you know, it reminds me, of course, when governors go to court on election matters until the case is properly settled and sometimes it goes on to the Supreme Court and takes about two, three years of their tenure, they're totally distracted. So every, you know, you're dealing with your lawyers and all that, you're not sure if you're going to remain in office or not. But um, it shouldn't be carte blanche as it is today. There should be some check to it. Okay. Now and talking about the judiciary, um, justice delayed is justice denied. So you can't have a country whereby you go to court and you're in court for three, four, five years on one case. You're going to exhaust the personnel in court they're going, to, they're going to cost a lot of money. So we should revamp or review our judiciary system, whereby a case, once it's filed in a court at the lower levels, within 90 days it must be adjudicated. Okay, and we can do it. So in, within 90 days, on the preponderance of evidence adduced, the judge will take a decision. If you don't have enough to, to file a case, then you don't go to court. You wait until you have enough. And if a case is filed, within 90 days, if you can't answer, then there's a problem somewhere. And so I will put 90 days for first, 45 days to 60 days for, for, for appeal. And not every case should go to the Supreme Court. If it has nothing to do with life or constitutional matter, it shouldn't get there. 
And the, the Supreme Court should be at liberty to determine which case they want to review or not. But uh, now everyone goes from the lower courts, even from the magistrate, magistrate courts to the, to the high courts, to the appeal court, to the Supreme Court. So the whole system is bogged down. We don't have enough judges to deal with it. They're so poorly paid, right? If we begin to talk about the I'm really glad that you mentioned that, yeah. poorly paid, not just the judges, the lawyers themselves, because I was privileged to be in a forum of young lawyers, and one of the major issues that he complained about was remuneration for young lawyers. So I think it's very important that we take a, a visit. We need to revisit the whole thing. They, well, if you talk about one what will you talk about, say, about the policemen? The police who you expect to go after, if you're, if you, if you're unfortunate enough and your, your car is robbed or you have a case with the police, you've got to buy fuel for them, you've got to provide vehicles for them, you've got... How can you run a system like that? So we've got to look at it. You're not um, the entire judicial system, which includes the police also, has to be reviewed. You know, we really need to start all over again to get this country right. Mm -hmm. Because you say this for this sector, you go to the next sector. If you go to education, you will say the same health. thing. Health. You I go to actually... health, you'll go the same thing. So we really need to start again. I was actually going to say, let's actually touch on some social issues that we're facing in Nigeria today. I would say that one of our greatest problems is drug abuse in Nigeria today. It's said that 7 million youths are addicted to drugs, 10,000 are dying every single year. We saw the BBC documentary that came out on codeine, right? The government came in and enforced certain policies after that. However, has the problem really been curtailed? We still have porous borders where things are coming in and out from. And quite frankly, drug abuse continues. How do we start to curtail this problem? Well, the problem is not being curtailed. The problem is being exacerbated mm. on two fronts. There are those who do the social stuff, social drugs, or do the hard drugs, heroin, cocaine, and all the fancy drugs because they can afford it and their particular lifestyle. Mm. But there's also a very broad segment of Nigerians who are on drugs out of frustration, right? And they just want to get out of there. An escape. Uh, uh, find, it's an, find it, see it as an escape. So how do you deal with that? It comes back to the issue of opportunities. And, you know, it's, it's even more prevalent in affluent homes. Because, yes, they're from affluent homes, but they're frustrated. They're not they're maybe educated. There are no jobs. Um, then at the lower levels, you have those who are so frustrated, so they take, they're the ones that take... Uh, Codeine and all these funny things and all that. Look, guess what? Some of them sniff glue. Yeah. Right? Some of them sniff petrol just to take their minds off it. And um, unfortunately, we don't have the institutions to deal with it. We don't have the medical personnel trained to deal with these issues. So that's why I said it's getting exacerbating. It's getting worse by the day. And um, I'm afraid I don't see any... I don't, I don't see any rainbow at the end of the... Yeah, a lot of people do not see rainbows, which is why I want us to take a little delve into mental health, because I believe it's very important. Now, we, you're a lawyer yourself, and you know that an attempt to commit suicide is punishable by law. And it's unfortunate that we're seeing people constantly trying to kill themselves. We're not doing enough with this is something to totally health. alien to us. It's part of the frustration Exactly. So now we're seeing people killing themselves. And if they, by any means, do not succeed in killing themselves, they're arrested and they're taken to court and they're being tried for attempted suicide. How does that really make sense? Sorry, let's actually forward. add into that that Nigeria is the 30th most depressive country in the world and we have a 2018 mental... Sorry, there's no mental health budget in the health budget. We have a 2018 health budget of 4%, just to make matters worse. Need I say more? I've said it all. We need to start right from the beginning, go back to the basics to get this country right. Our priorities are warped. It took Bill Gates to tell us that we're investing in infrastructure and total, total ignorance of human development, human capital development. Even the infrastructure that they say they're, they're investing, we don't see. So what's going on? The country is skewed in the wrong direction. So we've got to redress it. Totally, from the basics, you've got to look at educational curriculum, right? The teachers themselves need to be taught, the infrastructure to support teaching, the vast numbers to be taught. You go to the healthcare sector, patients die and doctors are not queried for it. You know, there should be responsibility, right, for patients and patient healthcare. You know, they get some diagnosis and you go there and you find that it's absolutely rubbish, you know and there are no consequences for it. 
We don't even have a working health insurance scheme for every Nigerian. These are some of Cross the Cross River, under my, under my beat, was the first state to sign up to the national health insurance scheme. But the scheme, a number of states didn't. The scheme itself, the scheme itself was a good start, and I support it, but it should be made compulsory. The essence is those who can afford will pay for those who cannot afford um, because they don't have jobs. But like I said, having a job or an opportunity should be a right of every citizen. So we should be so contributory that if I'm ill, I should be able to walk into any hospital and get treatment. And not the first question asking, you know, deposit ten or 20000 before the doctor even sees you. Doctors shouldn't be, you shouldn't do that. You, mm. it's, it's, <laughs> you, should be, you should lose your license for, for asking that. Treat first. And so they, it's part of a, a nation that has no safety valve completely, and that's why we talk about migration and all that. The fellow I spoke to who walked all the way to Italy said to me that he had come to a point where living here was living death. So dying, trying to do something was for him was better than just resigning himself to dying anyway. Yeah. And, you know, it's, we're better than this. We know it. We certainly are. Let's lighten up the conversation. How long have you been into music for? All my life. What's your favorite instrument? I think I started hearing music from the womb. Really? <laughs> I think nice. So. But consciously from the age of three. Really? Okay. I remember my starts? first music teacher, lady, uh, an English lady called Mrs. Matcham, right? And she taught me the piano and um, then did some voice training. I sing, by the way. Yes. I, th I think I enjoy singing even more than playing. Then... Um, then when I was in secondary school, I tried my hands on the guitar. No, primary school, I played the, guitar, the flute and still continued with the piano. In secondary school, I tried my hands on the guitar. Then later on, I got to meet Fela, and uh, I got pretty close to him, actually, and uh, fell in love with the saxophone. So at what point you were growing up, what was the plan for you at the end of the day? What was the future you saw yourself as a lawyer, <laughs> as a singer, no, it evolved. or as a politician? I remember at the age of 12 or 13, I wrote a letter to my father saying I wanted to be a musician. And my father knew this is a dangerous boy, so let me just, I have to handle this carefully. So he, he wrote me back a very kind letter saying that fantastic idea. I mean, yes, you are, it's a gift, it's a talent, but get, go through school, graduate. So even when you become a musician, you'll be a better musician than that. So at that stage, this is 12, 13, you know, it was the era of the Jacksons and all that. So you fancy yourself being a potential Michael Jackson, as it were. Um, then, but before then, you know, okay, I want to be a doctor. And I got into secondary school and I hated the sciences. I said, I'm not going to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be a doctor, you know. And what are your by, other the time, by the time I was getting to university, I actually wanted to study history. Wow. Right. Um, I liked history. It's storytelling. It's his story, you know, and her story. And as much as I want to say shout out to those who studied history, I think law is such a dignified profession. Well, that's what that's profession. what I was told. But you've just said it that the lawyers are frustrated, so I don't say the dignity. I mean, I'm a lawyer, and this uh -huh. is it's extremely <laughs> sad. <sexual laughs> <reason today. laughs> but it's a good profession. It gives an incredible one. background. I, I think what I whatever I am today, that background of being a lawyer, and I have a master's at law. I actually started a PhD. But I got, I got tired of it. it was, I started school at the age of three. And here I was, for, I was 23 then. So for 20 years nonstop I was in school. So I got tired and I left. And besides, I had a, a good job offer in the United States. But beyond that, the law background is a fantastic background. It just opens your eyes. The skills are taken off your eyes. And you see things differently. And you know, you're confident. I liked history because, you know, when you write history, you're writing about stuff no one was there. So you can invent your own stories yeah. and say it as it is, you know, and all that. I enjoyed history a lot, and um, but I was dissuaded to do and something. Pr else. Prospectively, if you were to become the next president of the Federal Republic of I Nigeria, I will become the next president. Okay, of the you know Republic. me from this side of the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful. Um, are we going to see history back in our schools? One of the saddest aspects of our educational curriculum is the absence of history in our curriculum. I don't know who took that decision. The certain words I would use, but I'm on camera, so I wouldn't use them. But I don't think those people are fit to ever lead our society or even be part of the society. If you don't know where you're coming from, how, how can you know where you're going? They say, oh, they're... Because, you see, the good, you know, we're a very young country. A lot of the actors 
in our history are still very much around. So it was done to protect them. But you can't live a lie, right? And our history is not the worst. I mean, if you go into black history in the United States, where, if I w go to Argentina, you know, in all of South America, you have blacks everywhere except Argentina. They literally wiped out every black. But they don't deny that. It's their history. They did it. Their forebearers did it. You've got to live it. You know, you've got to come to terms with it. So we are living a lie. Uh, a few, last year, yeah, it was last year, I chaired an occasion, the Asaba Massacre. And um, it took some very, I now call them patriots, right? And they put together and documented it. And some of the people we hero worship in our society today were behind that massacre. Um, but it doesn't take anything up. You know, every fam there's hardly any family in Asaba that was not affected by the massacre. You don't sweep it under the carpet. Just as you wouldn't sweep the fact that some renegade soldiers went and slaughtered the Sadana and his family or killed my malaria or did certain rubbish, uh, bad things or th things that are not acceptable. It's there. It's a fact. We should document it so that it never happens again. Absolutely. So now, Absolutely. that's a very fantastic point. I'm hoping that we'd actually get to see that happening. We'll get to see history back in our books and in our schools. Finally. If you were not running to what's becoming president of Nigeria in 2019, what would you be doing? And what do you envisage yourself? How do you plan to retire? Uh, I'll retire in a box, okay? About to be lowered into the ground. <laughs> That's when I'll retire. Because as long as you have breath in you, you can, you can be of use to one person or the other. You can help. If I weren't running, and even while running, I'm still doing other things. I'm not just that and that alone. There are many things folks like myself could do. We have the contacts. We have the leverage to make things happen. Um, I, would, I would not be too focused in being a millionaire any longer because if you haven't done it in your 40s, forget it. But I'd rather be doing things like helping in people in society actualize. My wife and I, for instance, we, we have a health foundation neither of us are doctors um, but we have medical missions quarter, quarterly right in Calabar and so we have these doctors some from overseas but the bulk of them from Nigeria and they offer one month of free medical care uh, I like to do more of that because it's it's so rewarding you can't put it into words we had we have cases where people have diseases or ailments that have been holding on for for years and you relieve them of it, you know. Um, the gratitude, the way they look at you, even without uttering a word of thanks, it's written on their faces. It's priceless. So you get to a stage in your life, you, are, you know, you've been taking and taking, you've got to start giving, you know. And, and that's what makes life, life worth, worth it. It's, life is about giving and taking. You breathe in and you breathe out. If you breathe in and you don't breathe out, you'll die. If you breathe mm. out all the time and you don't breathe in, would die so you must create that healthy balance okay one last question before we round up what do you think about people that don't like plantain because my co-host that's sitting here insults mm. me at least once a week for not liking plantain <laughs> i share that with her I don't you understand. Know, oh my God. i'll tell you something i started frying plantain not eating frying fried plantain dodo to be precise at about the age of four and um the we were privileged we had a cook steward and all that. He couldn't cope with my demand, so he taught me how to do it myself. And I have a number of scars on my stomach to show where the oil is. <laughs> I think that you should actually really. question your, but you know your Nigerianness if you don't like plantain. I, I like plantain. boiled plantain, but I don't like fried plantain. You don't even, like, boil, you don't even like any plantain either. Unfortunately, I just I like boiled. Unfortunately, and I've, gotten, I've had so much of it and now I don't really like it anymore. No, but at least you like it at some <laughs> point in your life. It's getting so the law of diminishing returns sets in at some point. Plantain, dodo, and beans is a knockout. <sighs> Okay, it is a knockout, but it's one of those things you can eat once in a while. Plantain on a regular basis. So what do you I think like? we should end this show right? now. What do you like? Me? Yeah. 
Amala, and anyway, to with Begiri. I'm from Oyo State. That's but the plantain of knows no knows no race, knows no you, boundaries. Well, you just say like you're getting tired of plantain. But at least he likes plantain. Okay, this conversation <laughs> is not about plantain. We've had the pleasure of speaking with the former governor of Cross River State and the current presidential aspirant. Thank you so much for Thank joining us. Thank you so us. much, sir. This has been a pleasure. very interesting it conversation. Has, it Thank has. You. Absolute Thank pleasure. To enjoy more of this, our Ubunke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.